and uh, you, you know because the model really wanted to be bigger. Uh huh. Um, and to get the depth of field and and to get uh, the, in some of the shots, the camera lens is two or three inches from the surface. Well, that surface, you, you know, I, I mean, on a, on a cinemascope screen. Um, you know, you blow up a, a speck of dust, and it looks like a it rock. has to look perfect. Yeah, it has to be absolutely perfect. So, uh, the I would think, I mean, I would need to have because I'd have to drop everything. So you, you know, I mean, I would want six figures, something in six figures, to just stop everything and stop my life and go to wherever the ship was and you know do all that, you know, and leave my girlfriends and all my, you know, everything, and then I would think it would cost, I mean, if he spent 240000 on it and spent that again to have it restored to absolutely perfect, so paying, you know, top model makers, which Jim can put his hands on, you know, Jim Dow, uh, who built it, um, he's still, he's got his fingers and all the, you know, he knows all those people. Mark right. Stetson knows people, um, and get that baby absolutely ready for paint, and 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 spend that kind of money again. Okay, he's got half a million into it. Well, the ship cost. I mean, what Paramount ended up paying for it was probably a bit more than that. Wow. Considering all the all the man hours that were into it and everything, because I think when I got to it, I think they said it, it was it was damn close to. Uh, a quarter of a million dollars right there. By the time and, I got uh, the 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 paperwork that we have somewhere, I've got somewhere from Paramount listed as four hundred and some odd thousand dollars in the budget of of its final completed cost. Back in uh, yeah, I, and I, you know what, and and it's 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 prop that's probably what it was. Um, and the movie, uh, I mean, because the TV budget was four million dollars. Uh, when they started doing the, you know, when, when they realized they had to uh, redo everything. And then I think they bumped that up to 12. Um, and I've seen uh, budgets where people said the film cost 20 or 30 or 40 million. We all heard it cost 120. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it was way over the top. That's what, like was, you, that's what was going around. I mean, uh, you, you know, you had uh, Doug Trumbull's had uh, what we had a hundred and probably a hundred and thirty people, hundred and fifty people uh, were on this, the whole staff at, at EEG, and then John Dykstra had the same amount as well, and working on models and effects and everything. So you've got three hundred very highly paid people. Working stupid hours, and and in 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 the movie business, they they pay you on uh, you, you they pay you on an eight hour if you're on an hourly rate, which everyone was. So you're getting your hourly rate, and then eight to ten hours you're getting time and a half. Then ten to twelve hours you're getting double time, and anything over twelve hours is golden time, and that's four times your hourly rate. And everybody was you know got at least two to four hours a day in on golden time. Right. Mm -hmm. As you would, you well, know. All I can say, Paul, is if I win the lottery, I'll buy the model from him and I'll hire you and the whole crew to redo it. Boy, <laughs> I like the way you think. Because <laughs> who wouldn't? I mean, that thing is, I mean, having it all done like that to somebody like us would be worth every penny and more. I mean, it's priceless. It's irreplaceable. And it's well, just so I mean, sad, the state of condition it's in now. Yeah, exactly, and 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 the fact that he spent that kind of money, and just think about it: if you bought a rare old car for say a hundred thousand dollars, right? That mm -hmm. needed, uh, I mean, a real rare, uh, like like a Duesenberg, right? But it was an absolute piece of junk, and needed complete restoration. You'd be more than happy to spend another hundred on it. Because oh, what sure. you would have at the end of it is something that's worth a million or more, you know. Exactly, yeah. Well, you know, it's known, too, that a lot of the electrical is um, fried in it, too. You know, you mentioned in one of your stories that somebody came in there and burned half of that up. And you can see yeah. that uh, as the ship uh, progresses through some of the movies, 
that there's different things that don't work on it anymore, and they kind of tried to hide it, but you could oh, tell. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can tell. Those of us that are really into it notice all that stuff. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, I guess because getting back into it would be a nightmare, you know, so they would they would do what the, whatever CGI tricks they could pull and, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, Industrial Light and Magic, when they took over filming the miniature, they had they had some major problems and caused some lighting failures uh, when they were hooking it up. Ah. According to one yeah. of their effects people, uh, made some statements about it on, in the making of the Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan, yeah. and there's certain lights on it that never worked after that. Yeah. Well, I mean, so it, I, I mean, basically. You know, what's his name, whoever he is who has the model, it would pay for him to have all modern electrics put in. Definitely, yeah. Definitely. And, and, you know, taking the top of the dish off, I mean, Jim could be pulled in on that um, because he, he would intimately know the insides and, you know, where you want to make your surgery. Um, and I, I, I just, I mean, I think it would be well worth it. And, if, what I'll do is, uh, if you guys are pretty sure that it was the vice president of Microsoft who bought it, uh, I'll track him down and, and write to him and say, "Hey." It, it, it was one of the. It was definitely one of the VPs at Microsoft, and uh, it has been on public display at the Microsoft campus in one of their buildings. Um, that, along with, I know the Excelsior for, that ILM built from yeah. one of the later movies was there, and several of the, the other models, too. Mm -hmm. well, that would be great, Paul, and I know a lot of people. You know, I don't know how much Star Trek news you follow, but from the original TV series, they had this full-size mock-up of one of the shuttlecraft, the shuttlecraft Galileo 7 that they used on the original uh, TV show where they would once in a while need it for, like, Filming scenes where they were actually walking inside of it and things like oh, right. that. Yeah, yeah. the that, uh, the on set on stage full prop. That yeah. was uh, been languishing away in somebody's back lot for all these years. Well, a couple of fellows bought that, and uh, they've been having it restored by a yacht building company because it's all made out of wood. Right. And uh, out in uh, where was it out on the east coast somewhere? A yacht, yeah, Maine or New York or something. Well, they've recently completed it, and it's on display now at the NASA Space Control Center in Houston, Texas. It's going really? to be there permanently. Yeah, yeah. and it's a and huge NASA. attraction. They have a piece of science fiction, Paul, uh, from a TV show next to one of the Saturn V rockets that went to the moon or was made to go to the moon. Yeah, so That's how important this stuff that. is. Yeah, no, yeah. I know. Well, I just, listen, I know. <laughs> you know... Yeah. More astronauts credit Star Trek for the reason why they became scientists and astronauts than, than anything else in their lives. When you hear them in interviews, the one science fiction thing they bring up all the time was, has always been Star Trek. Mm -hmm. wow. Definitely. I mean, it's, well, it's been see, a very I mean, important association with NASA. Absolutely. And, and, I mean, that just adds more value to the Enterprise. And, of course, Getting we all know, I mean, that particular model is the icon. Uh, oh, it is, yeah. It's the star of the series. I mean, it's not yeah. It's not uh, Patrick or, or William or Leonard. It's the ship. That's it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Which is something the new people that make the new Star Trek don't understand. That they don't understand it. To the fans. That's what we feel anyway. The yeah. ship is a character just like Kirk or anyone else, but it's not treated that way. Well, yeah, I mean, the ship is, is, is the vehicle through which all the adventures take place. You, you know, it's, that's, that's mother. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. That's home to a lot of us fans. Yeah. We think of it as us being part of it, too. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. You, don't, you don't think of, of the base in San Francisco or, uh, or some object out in space. You think of the Enterprise. That's right. Paul, have you seen the new movies, the 2009 or the, the latest one, or heard anything yeah, I about saw, them? Yeah, I saw, the, uh, uh, I saw the latest one when I was in, in uh, California, and it was, it was a good film. Uh, unfortunately, the following week I saw Man of Steel, and that, oh. <laughs> that was one of the best movies I have ever seen in my life. It is superb. Yeah, we all liked it. <laughs> yeah, we enjoyed it too. Yeah. What a movie. I mean, mm -hmm. boy, from 
and I'm real picky. Uh, I'm real fussy about writing and directing and lighting and you know, cinematography and all that. The act, you know, everything. As and it should be. I, yeah. That, that film hit a ten all the way across the board. It was perfect. Mm -hmm. And the effects were. Astounding. What do you think about the way that they've uh, changed the design of the way the Enterprise looks now, Paul, compared to the classic? Well, I mean, I. I yeah, I mean, I I like uh, I like, I mean the even when Richard designed the Enterprise, I mean when I saw it, obviously I was absolutely gobsmacked when I walked into the spray booth and there it was. Um, but even back in '78, um, you know, Richard was harking back to some Art Deco stuff, which is great, but it and and he was doing it from a. a uh, a movie homage kind of a point of view, but uh, I think the uh, uh, y you know it needed it it needed to be jazzed up and and I think you know the various models or or, or the CGI ones are are uh, pretty interesting. Okay, yeah. You you We're... do know Paul that they uh, there's a little homage to your painting on the refit in the um, Star Trek. F the two new Star Trek films, because in a couple sequences, when the camera pans just right over the saucer, there's an iridescent uh, paneling uh, effect that they put on the CGI models that is totally reminiscent to the motion pictures refit. Oh, I didn't spot that. Oh, it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well I, the, the I looked without question, and I've gone back and looked at it on Blu-ray several times. So. What in the last movie? It, yes. It, mm -hmm. with for sure, yes. But you can also see it uh, in the last sequence before the ship goes to warp in the yeah. 2009 Star Trek movie. They pan across the saucer, and you can see the iridescent color paneling on What's the CGI the, model. Which movie is the 2009 one? What's the, the one that's just called Star Trek? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Star Trek, yeah, 2009 version. Okay. It's the first I recently, with the uh, Kirk Spock characters. I recently built one of those models, Paul. They have uh, there's a company uh, company and you can't find them here in the states. They're only available from Germany, and I painted yeah. it all up just with all your iridescent panels and everything on there, just like that. So. What what airbrush do you use, Boyd? An Awada. Ah. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, at, what with. Uh, what a, a, a siphon feed with the cups, or do you use one with a built-in? It's a built-in gravity feed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, here is. I'm trying to see where I am. Okay, here's my Awata from about 1985, maybe. Mm -hmm. And that was 300 and some odd dollars. Right. Back then. Back then. Right. Here is a Chinese one that is <laughs> that is every bit as nice and maybe even a bit nicer. And that was uh, in dollars. That was fourteen dollars. Not bad. <laughs> yeah. that's, I think yeah. that's the one I use. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. And and um, I mean even the here I've got the this is the. This is the one I painted the model with. Where are we? There. Um, and that Pache, that was, I think that was 65 bucks. Wow. Back then. Double action? It's a Pardon? double action, yeah. Yeah, double action. Yeah, yeah, it's double action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, single action, forget it. I mean, That's amazing that you still have that, Paul. You know what I wish I had, Boyd? I wish I had the jars of paint. I kept them. I, I, I kept those four jars. They were little ones. They were only about, well, they were four ounce jars, so about that big around and about that high. Uh, and I only went through half the paint in each of the jars. That's the same yeah. thing we've been noticing, Paul. That 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 you spray that stuff on so lightly that yeah. you don't hardly use any paint. Yeah. No, you don't. You don't. You, you really don't need much. And then, and and. You know, like I said in the book, and I'm sure you know, Boyd, from you know all the work you've done, is that you can always add, but you can't take it away. That's right. Yeah. So you just do it nice and easy, and build it up bit by bit until you get the levels that you want. You know. 
Paul, these I'll show you really fast, and hopefully you'll be able to see it. These are what a lot of us are using now. These are uh, from a company called Polytranspar. Yeah. These are these are lacquer based. Yeah, I yeah, that's what you want. They are. Uh, we're getting these through these taxidermy people. <laughs> really? But, uh, yeah, yeah. They a company yeah, they, called Wasco. They, they make do the. the oh, Wasco, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I've got a. I, I think I've got a URL uh, in the book that somebody yeah, to, printed in the book, isn't it? Down at, yeah. the, at the end in the airbrush section. Yes. Yeah, they were bought out by a taxidermy supply company, and they're the producer of the polytranspar paints. Because yeah, you know they paint the when they mount those fish and everything, they do the the fish scales and everything. It's that same iridescent. Oh. Uh, yeah, and that's the closest that we've found to looking just right out of everything and, that's and, out there. And, and how, what are those? Three or four ounces? Those jars? Th these are four ounce jars. You can get them in different sizes. And, and yeah. how, so the four ounce jar. And how many? What different colors do you get? They're flip flop colors, right? They're, they're yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, this one is called uh, sparkling gold, but it actually, you know, it, it disappears and then, then the gold comes back. Yeah. And then you've got a, a shimmering blue, like an emerald blue, that yeah. disappears and comes back. And then there's a red that's, the red sort of um, will go from sort of a red to a green almost. It'll change yeah, yeah. back and forth. Yeah, yeah, they, they should go to the complement. Right. Of the color, yeah. And then there's a, uh, I think it's called emerald green also. That's yes. a really beautiful shade of green, yeah. Light. Right, which, which will go to purple. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly what they do. Um, and so how much are those jars? How much do they cost? They're not that expensive. I think they're, this one uh, I sent for these, they were about 8 eight or $9 for a four-ounce jar. <laughs> okay. I, paid, and, uh, I paid $48 for each jar back in 78. Those were just coming onto the market. I think you mentioned when they. Uh, yeah, and, and it was a it was a little company called Crescent, and uh, I mean they were little handmade labels that were stuck on the jars, you know. It Talking was, about how little you use, Paul. I don't know if you can see here, but I painted a complete model with this, and the the jar is still full up to here. Yeah, yeah. That's you how don't little need you much. use of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no, you don't. You don't need much. And one thing and that. Lacquers are really great because they melt into each other, you know, because the, the thinner is the solvent, and so you get that wonderful, wonderful sheen. Right. One thing about this stuff, too, that we've kind of found out is you really have to make sure and stir it and shake it really well because the, the pigments tend to settle in the bottom here Yeah. Uh, really bad if they just sit even for a little while. So. Yeah. But, yeah, um, it's great to work with. Boyd, Dave says he can't make it in, his technical problems, but he is watching, and he um, he wants me I, to tell Paul that he was hoping to be able to meet you today, uh, but he is watching. Bye, um, Dave. So thanks for the <laughs> shout-out to him. <laughs> yeah, well, that's too bad for Dave. Hopefully he'll get that resolved. Well, I guess we'll kind of officially kick things off here then, guys, and uh, I'll start out okay, by well, saying... Okay, well, let me just top up my glass, okay? Okay, sure, Paul. Hang on, I'll be right back. I'll be back in two seconds as well. Okay. I think it might be a good idea. I'm going to go top off mine too, guys. Take a quick break and we'll... Chris, can you hear us? Chris? Okay, I'm back. All right. Oh, by the way, I've got um, I've got this um, decal sheet as well. Oh man, I've got that. That's amazing. Oh lord. <laughs> yeah, that, that was that was a big hit at the at the show actually. Oh, I bet it would be. I would stand there and drool over it for an hour. I'm sure myself. <laughs> it's the only one left. Oh, wow. Yeah, we've got to have you show that here in a minute again, Paul. Well, you let me know when you want to see it, Boyd, okay? Okay, that is awesome. I took the opportunity to freshen up my drink here, too. Now, Paul, you was talking earlier about going to conventions and things like that. Yeah. Uh, I know there's a... Uh, I belong to a 
group here in the states called IPMS, and I know they have a UK branch. Have you thought about approaching them about attending some of their nationals they have? Chris, I, you know, I, I, I'm out of the loop totally. So, uh, what, what are they called? Well, for the branch in the UK, it's called IPMS UK. IP. What? MS. Yeah, UK. Yeah. And the United States is IPMS USA. So. Right, and IPMS is an acronym for what? International Plastic Modeler Society. Ah. And they put on shows? Well, they put on many conventions, and they, most of the time they put on one big convention. Uh, the Nationals for the United States was just held earlier in August. Right. And I don't know when the one is planned for the United Kingdom yet. Right, okay. This, this all helps. Oh, they would love to have you there, Paul, or you, yes, and, your yeah. you and your friends, yeah, Great. because they would really be into that. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I just, you know, I think we should try and uh, lobby Creation Entertainment again and, uh, you know, and maybe if they get, because uh, there's a guy, uh, Robert Minns, in Holland, who has a, a site. Um, like, is it Trekmark? No, I can't remember what his site is. And he's quite knowledgeable. And he wrote to them, and they blanked him totally. Oh. But well, I think, yeah, I think it's going to take the fans to get behind that movement. Yeah, yeah, because mm -hmm. the thing is, is... Um, I'm not so sure how how easy it would be to get Jim Dow to do it, um, but I know uh, Richard um, and Mark and and Mark if if Mark's so busy all the time, but if he's not busy, would love to do it as well. And he's a good speaker, but so is Richard. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I'm sure it, and Richard's busy as well. But if you know if we were scheduled ahead enough, and sure. there were you know the expenses and a uh, you know something on top was paid for the for the thing, um, you know and I mean if 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 we could get Jim, Richard and myself there, one at, at a place. I mean you've got the three central elements of what you know made the enterprise the enterprise. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I guess I'm going to do a formal start off here, and okay. everybody. And uh, uh, I'm your host, Boyd Crompton. Everybody that's uh, tuned in, we're really fortunate today to have a special guest with us, Paul Olson, who is responsible for this book that he just uh, put out called "Creating the Enterprise." We're really glad to have you with us here today, Paul. And Thank we've you. just been discussing and talking about uh, Paul's work with the original uh, model used in Star Trek: The Motion Picture. And Paul, before we get into a little bit of the Star Trek stuff, would you maybe talk to our viewers a little bit about how you first became uh, involved as an airbrush and painting artist and what led you sort of up to Star Trek? Um, well, I mean, I've always been, like at school, I was always the artist, you know, the, and, and so that was certainly going to be my direction in life anyway. And then um, I, I was living in San Francisco and I was right there in the Haight Ashbury when all that thing exploded. And I I had a background in photography and in printing. And that and with my art, combining that together, I was able to do uh, posters uh, using mechanicals rather than color separation. So that I would do say a three color poster in magenta, cyan and yellow, which basically gives you any color you want. Um, and in three separate layers of black and white art, and then plates are made from that. So I would I would do a, the yellow plate in black ink or black pencil or whatever, and then that plate would be inked up with yellow, and then I would do the magenta one, and I would do the blue one. So I'd create the color separation in my head, and I could do posters, and just like Wes Wilson did and Rick Griffin and uh, Mouse and all those guys, 
uh, creating posters because they were all done in black and white. They weren't done in color, all the Fillmore and Avalon posters. And uh, and then when I moved to England, I, uh, I ran into uh, Robin Trower, who I'd known in America when Procol Harum would, uh, first came to America. We met them, and they would stay with us at the Funky Features House in the Haight-Ashbury. And then I moved to England, and a year after I moved to England, I was just walking down the little road. I... I lived out in the countryside outside of London, and there was one of the two top recording studios in London just happened to be around the corner from where I lived, um, a place called Olympic, where the Rolling Stones recorded all their records, and Cream, and you know lots of people, but um, Abbey Road being the other one. And um, I was, on a Sunday morning, I was walking around to get some milk, and uh, some eggs at the dairy that was only open between 8 and 10 a.m. So you could get your newspapers and you could get your breakfast stuff. Everything else was closed on Sunday. And there was this bad honking of a horn behind me, and I turned around, and it was Robin and his manager, who I knew, and they recognized me from behind, and they didn't know I was living in England. And it was, it was just one of those magic moments. And uh, so being that Robin was had left Procol Harum and they were going to Olympic, it didn't take a mass genius to work out that he was working on, on his first album. And I said to Robin, I said, are you doing your album? And I was then, and he said, yes. I said, would you like me to do your cover? And as I said that, he said, how would you like to do my cover? <laughs> Oh, so, <laughs> excellent! Uh, yeah, you know it was serendipity, and um, so uh, he said, "Come up and listen to the music." So I, I went up, and they were running through some of the tracks, and they were mixing them. And um, uh, Robin said, "I'm I'm titling the album Twice Removed from Yesterday,' which is a kind of ethereal uh, title, which I quite liked." And um, so I thought, okay. So I went home and I did some sketches for an hour and I, little pencil sketches and I came back to the studio and he looked at him. He said, oh, I want that one. And I said, okay, I hadn't thought about color. What's your favorite color? And he said, blue. And so I did that one in blue and I painted it in oils on a big canvas, on a 36 inch wide canvas and blending the oils like you would do with an airbrush, but I didn't know how to use an airbrush at the time. And uh, but I wanted it to have that look, but it was a pain in the neck to do. I mean, trying to make an oil painting look like an airbrush painting is like trying to make an airbrush painting look like an oil painting. You know, it just doesn't work. <laughs> and um, so I and so the album he loved the album cover. It came out great. And then I did his next five covers, but the the next two uh, I did in England, and then I moved to L.A. Um, and I was wanting to learn how to use an airbrush, and it just so happened the girl I moved, I came over with, we met each other at the Supertramp Moving to America party uh, here in London, and uh, and then w we were going to start a studio in San Francisco, and we fought all the way across America, driving across America, and she took the car in the middle of the night with all my stuff in it and drove down to L.A. <laughs> oh. to to meet up with a friend of a friend of mine who I had never met, and that was Peter Lloyd, who was a top airbrush artist. I mean, one of the top in the world. And, um, and I, I suppose Peter's most famous worldwide uh, piece of artwork is uh, uh, Rod Stewart's Atlantic Crossing. But Peter was superb, superb airbrush artist. And so then when I tracked the, my girlfriend down and I met Peter and he needed some work and I decided to stay in LA and he taught me how to use an airbrush and uh, and then Peter had a friend named Ed who was English as well. Peter was English and Ed was English and Ed shared a studio with another illustrator who went to school with Jim Dow who built the Enterprise and Jim called up this other illustrator Charlie White and said you know we need somebody who can use an airbrush do you know anybody? And uh, Charlie said to Ed, don't you know someone? And uh, Ed said, yeah. 
and he called me up and he said, Paul, how would you like to paint a Starship Enterprise? Wow, what a phone call that had to have no, been. <laughs> the most amazing phone call I've ever had. Mm -hmm. so, and at that, uh, at that time, Paul, uh, were you a fan? Uh, had you watched much of the original television series? or No. <laughs> not really? I, I hadn't. Boy, I, I, it's a terrible thing to say, but you know, nobody who worked on the film, with the exception of Andy Probert, no one was really into Star Trek. And because, I mean, quite frankly, the television series was not all that well done. I mean, what they were trying to do with it was very interesting, but I mean, it wasn't state-of-the-art considering what people in the film business were working on at the time. So they weren't really all that, you know, interested in that kind of thing. I mean, when you look what Jim worked on on Silent Running with Doug Trumbull, and that came out, what, the two or three years before Star, Star Wars? 1971. I mean, so five, six years before Star Wars. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, thank you for that. So, I, and, and that was, you know, pretty groundbreaking, all that stuff. And that those guys were streets ahead of what was going on on television at the time. So, you know, nobody who was involved in the film business was really, you know, didn't give TV stuff much, uh, you know, cop, really. Right. Well... Describe to us, Paul, how it was with the first couple of meetings, maybe, and talk about how was it presented to you? Were you just kind of given an open slate as far as how you would apply the paintwork on the model, or did they bring you in specifically for some, uh, because they were interested in sort of some of your techniques, or uh, how did that all come about? Well, no, I, I mean, uh, when uh, Jim called Charlie, who spoke to Ed, who called me, um, and then Ed gave me Jim's phone number, and I called Jim up. I mean, this all happened in an afternoon. And I called Jim up at, at Magicam, and um, he said, well, come down and bring your portfolio. So I went down, and his office was in the front of the building, and I showed him my stuff. And he said, I think you'll do fine. And um, we agreed on, on finance, and he said, follow me in. We walked down the hallway, and he, we went into the big model shop first, and he introduced me to Mark Stetson. And then we came back, and the spray booth was on the right side of the hallway, and he opened the door in the spray booth, and there she was. So wow. Knocked me out. Knocked me out. And all white and just, you know, like a virgin, with her wing, like I said in the book, with her wings spread, waiting for me to have my way with her. And... Um, and it, Jim had, he had used pearlescent paints on a 1935 Ford he had restored. And, and he said, uh, and he talked to me about using pearlescent paints and told me where I could go to try and find them. Um, and Susanna Swansea, who was going to paint it, but she just didn't have the airbrush skills, um, had worked on the Aztec pattern that... I didn't know at the time, but Richard Taylor had come up with that idea of using oh. the Aztec. And I only just found this out when I did the interviews. Um, just yeah, we were all curious about that as well, who came up with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Richard Taylor. So he came, because I thought Susanna came up with it. But, um, and so all these years, I was under the impression it was Susanna, but it wasn't, it was Richard. And, and, and I guess he art directed her and probably drew a panel, and then she made friskets for it. And but uh, and and she voluntarily said, "I can't do this. You know, I, I'm not skilled enough." And so that's when Jim uh, called Charlie. Wow! And, oh, uh, but I'll tell you, I mean, it was it was breathtaking to stand there, and uh, and then Jim said, "Okay, she's all yours, Paul. You know, go get some paints and." shut the door, <laughs> and there I was. <laughs> wow. And I was going to paint this thing. And I had never airbrushed a physical object, only illustration board. And I was wow. just developing my airbrush skills. I mean, I wasn't at all, a, you know, a skilled airbrush artist at all. And uh, so it was a bit of a golf moment. Wow, I'll bet, yeah. Did you sleep well that night, or did you start on it that same day, Paul, or did you uh, did you have a little time to 
digest all that before you actually had to go to work on it. I I can only think what must have happened, Boyd. I mean, I can't I can't imagine I slept very much that night um, because I. I'd gone down, I found a store where I could get the paints, and I had the paints, and I came back, I went back up to my house, got all my gear, came down, and I started screwing around with the paints that afternoon, and I, I was probably, I probably didn't sleep all that well, and I was probably anxious to get stuck in the next day, but also anxious not to screw up, you know, and, and so I spent quite a, I think I spent three or four days just working on bits of plastic and trying to understand what was happening with the colors and all that and uh, basically putting it off, <laughs> 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 making a start, you know, because, I mean, that baby was sitting there and it was all that, you know, everything was resting on me now and, uh, uh, but, um, so I started on the top of the dish and uh, it, 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 it went quite well right from the get-go, so then that was okay. Oh, you, that's where you started. Yeah, we've often wondered that, where you actually began yeah. work on the Model 2. On, on, the outer, on the outer ring on the top, on the, on the, on the, no, on the bottom part of the dish. Sorry, it was on the bottom part of the dish. Um, okay. And on the, on the outer ring, and I, I, I cut friskets. So I spent a lot of time cutting friskets because I think there are seven or nine concentric rings on the model. Uh -huh. And so each ring has has to have its own uh, uh, positive and negative set of friskets for each panel going around, you know, because you've got different radii. And uh, so that took a long time because they had to be absolutely spot on, you know. So I was using a compass knife and, you know, getting it absolutely right. Wow, that's incredible. And, Paul, as you, as you went along, was it sort of your – decision then as far as like the the way that you uh, kind of blended all the colors together and where you made the color shifts and everything like that that was just totally up yeah, to you every, yeah everything was um, and that's where um, uh, Andy Probert um, came in later on after we moved uh, I suppose I had done probably a third of the ship and uh, and then he showed up and he was trying to tell me what to do and I had to tell him to fuck off basically excuse my language but <laughs> uh, and uh, I had to have him banned from the from the uh, model shop because you know he he thought he was in charge he was the art director and he wasn't and uh, so you know we bang heads and so I never uh, I I didn't have anything to do with him after that. Hmm. But, so oh, yeah, it was all mine. I mean, because it, it, I was hired, you know, as right. the mm -hmm. That's totally understandable, yeah. Yeah, you know. It's your, uh, it's your vision that they bought into, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, Paul, what uh, would you say, what would you tell uh, some of us model builders out there? Because we're dealing with sort of the same thing, only a little bit smaller scale. What was your opinion of, of what was the most difficult areas to paint on that, on that model? Uh... The most difficult areas. Um, I can't. I'm, I'm. I'm just trying to think. I can't. I suppose. Well, none of it was difficult. It. It. It was. Um, it was more time consuming to paint the fuselage because the fuselage is a compound curve, and so I had. I had to use magic tape for frisket. I couldn't use um, I couldn't use uh, uh, acetate sheets because the, the friskets I used on the, on the dish were acetate. I mean the dish has a bit of a curve to it, but it's not compound, and uh, so the acetate will bend, you know, so you could hold it down and spray. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, so and so that was time consuming, and you know, sort of cutting the tape and sticking it down and. Um, and then I would have little tiny rectangles and parallelograms and various shapes of, of acetate frisket cut that I could spray a, a little window, a little part of a panel, and then 
take a frisket and break it up with a little vertical bit and some horizontal bits and overlay colors over colors. But I, I think the the fuselage took quite a bit of time, be, only because of that factor. Okay. And Paul, uh, after the initial uh, paint job was completed, you've kind of explained or mentioned a little bit in your book that there were some changes and revisions that were done. Uh, we've seen some photos of uh, some of the early test shots of the model. And for example, on the uh, bottom area, uh, below the shuttle bay where it makes that sort of curve there, some of the early photos show some uh, painting that you did where there's basically just some sort of free-handed uh, streaks that are on that area. And it looks like that was maybe changed a little bit later. And then uh, they had to make some changes due to filming issues or things like that that maybe you right. could explain. You mean, uh, you mean on, at, on, on the, on the fantail of the ship? On the, yeah, where it makes that curve. Yeah, you underneath, some, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. No, that wasn't. I, that, that was all freehand, and I just did that. Uh, that went real fast. <laughs> you know, I had, I had that all masked off. And I just, um, I just freehanded it, so the ship was on its side, and I just made several passes freehand with different colors back and forth and back and forth. I mean, that probably, you know, that probably took half an hour, if that. And but didn't didn't they uh, change that or something later? Because there, we, the pictures that we've seen, uh, that's not on the bottom of the um, that little area anymore. Like it had been changed or something or. Uh, there's some of the little patterns that look a little bit different. Uh, what on the first movie? Yes. I, I no, I don't think so. I, I if if it was changed, because uh, Ron said, uh, because when when I finished the ship, then I was moved to another facility where I was helping design special effects, and and so Ron, who had painted the the engineering section, you know, with all that bluey greeny. You know, we call that the strong back. Yeah. Okay, the strong back. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you see in the in the video where he says, uh, you know, the house, the Enterprise's house? <laughs> yeah. When he's yeah about I, the I mean, we didn't know it, all that stuff, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But <laughs> okay, the strong back. Uh, so Ron painted that, and then he was around whilst they were shooting to do any touch-ups um, that were required. But I don't remember him saying that he had anything to do with that. They, you know, he, uh, they, they changed the bottom, that bottom, whatever it's called, on the bottom of the dish. And then, of course, when Mark had to make the new bridge because of the, the uh, uh, dripping from the air conditioning duct that popped off the wooden bridge. Um, so Ron did all that. But um, if anything was changed... I wonder if it's on the original film or if they CGI'd it for DVD. Uh, Jerry is our resident refit expert here, Paul. Maybe Jerry can elaborate on that a little bit for okay. you. Jerry, you're muted. Over to you, Jerry. Sorry about that. There were changes <laughs> made to it when it was um, when, at Industrial Light and Magic. They made some painting changes uh, oh, well, that's to a, the yeah, model. That's the second movie. But that's the second movie, and boy, I just want to point out if I can do a screen share here, which I'm trying sure. to get pulled up, um, if it will actually shine to show. Are you guys seeing a picture on the screen of the Enterprise? No. No? Well, let me see. Chris. Nope. Let me see if I can do it a different there way. Yeah. There, there it is. There it is. Well, there it was on there for a second. Okay, well, let me let me... Pop it back, see if it comes up. It may take with my bandwidth a minute for that to come up. Is it is it showing up? No, just you. No. Let me go back to screen share and tell it what to do again. I just love modern technology. <laughs> Jerry, you're in. See Texas. if that comes oh, up on the screen. There it is. Oh, there it is. Yes. Yeah. I'm up on the. I'm I'm about 300 miles south of um, Boyd, uh, the Mexican uh, border, at the tip of Texas. This is this is a scene from the the last sequence in the film, and and you can see here, Boyd, those panel changes had not been done. It's still perfectly smooth. 
uh, yeah. on the bottom of the model uh, yeah. in terms of those uh, other sequences. No, I, I nothing. Um, uh, you, you know, Ron didn't change anything. Um, all he did was um, he repaired the top when when it popped off, and uh, and then if there was any touch up needed doing, but he didn't do any any um, anything else. Well, uh, uh, what I was kind of thinking of, Paul, is uh, Jerry and I had, were looking at some pictures one evening, and uh, Jerry, what I was talking about was some of the paint patterns, you know, where there were sort of some arrow-looking uh, designs that were painted on it, and the um, there's some early production photos of it, Paul, where you can see that it's been painted, but there's differences on the shape of the bridge and some of the other little things that they moved and changed around on it during the uh, making of the motion picture. There were a little bit of uh, di uh, different uh, Aztec patterns that were oh, actually the, painted. You're, you're referring to one of these. Um, let me see if I can pull this up. I don't. I don't think so. I don't see, think that's, anybody. That's why we're asking. Uh, we, we're asking you because there's people uh, that have been writing books and things like that, trying to explain all that. And uh, well, no, the only. I mean, y you know, I wasn't there um, when they were shooting the model. So, um, but Ron was. Um, so I, I, you know, we'd have to get the various questions together and ask him. But I, at the same time, you, you know, you're dealing with um, uh, thirty-three-year-old memories, thirty-four-year right. memories. You know, right. when and and at the time, you know, we weren't. We were just working on a project, and we weren't thinking it was. You know, it was going to have. The, the import uh, that it has down through the future. And, and uh, so you don't, it, you're not sort of filing it away in that kind of like permanent um, area of your brain. Um, but, um, I, you know, Ron certainly remembered, you know, a lot of the stuff he did in the garden, for instance. <laughs> did you pick up on that? That would be, yeah, that would be called the Arboretum, Paul. Oh, uh, the Arboretum, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So we got the strum back in the arboretum. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, did you did you pick up on uh, on what he was hinting there? In yes. The mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cocaine. Sprinkled <laughs> <laughs> out throughout the arboretum. Oh. Oh wow. Yeah. I was also. We were also fascinated, Paul, about when you mentioned something a little, you had a little fun there talking about some uh, things that were possibly placed inside the saucer, and yep, we're all curious a, about what that might be. There was, uh, uh, Chris Elliott and I put in a dildo and, <laughs> oh. um, and a bunch of condoms. <laughs> oh, man. So I'm sure that so, stuff stall, is still all in there. They've never reopened it since then, as far as I've heard of. Uh, well, no, well, I I don't know, but yeah, it, but it certainly was in there for the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? So, folks, when you're watching the movie, you know yep. what's inside the dish, and on top of that, you know what's inside the arboretum. <laughs> <laughs> I will never view that movie the same. It's again. it's party exactly. time on board the Enterprise. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, Paul. Uh, Talk up a little bit more then about because uh, one of the one of the really interesting parts in your book that I thought was really cool that you described is when you uh, were t were taken into the area for the first time when they finally had the model uh, all set up under the studio lighting and how it looked to you. Well, um, you know, I was I was working on the model in uh, well three locations, um, all lit up with just industrial. You know those cheap industrial four tube um, neon lights. You know, um, so lots of flat light, and uh, uh, which is what you want. You know, when you're working on something. And so after I completed everything, um, they wheeled the model out onto the shooting stage, and then locked off the shooting stage, and nobody could go there. Nobody, not even Doug. You know, director of effects uh, for three days, and um, they 
got it all lit up, and it was lit. I, I explained in the book, but I'll mention it again here. It was very clever what they did. The lighting guys had several spots that they would throw down on the ground, and on the ground were big styrofoam blocks that had dentists' mirrors in them of various um, diameters that were stuck into the styrofoam blocks, and then they could they could take that beam of light, they'd hit them, and they could angle it up to the model and light up a section of the model, and depending on whether they put Vaseline over the, you know, they could they could make it a soft light, they could put a filter over it and make it a color light, um, and they lit the model that way, and it was very clever, but we didn't know what they were doing. Nobody knew what they were doing. And uh, when they finally got the thing lit, and it was in the dry dock, um, and or the space dock, or what do you call that? Dry dock. That's right. dry dock. Right. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Strong back dry dock uh, <laughs> operator. Uh, and uh, and so we all got together, and they led us into the shooting stage, and it's all black velvet curtains everywhere, and it was a twenty foot ceiling, and the floors painted black. The shooting stage is all black, and it was enormous because they were shooting different models in different areas. And uh, we had to hold hands, and we were placed around where the model was, but we didn't know where it was. And then they turned off the lights. They lit that baby up, and it was it was um, breathtaking. I mean, everybody went, <gasps> it was stunning. It was like you were out in outer space, and there it was in front of you. It, uh, it was, it was mind blowing. It really was. How incredible! Yeah. It was so beautiful, and I couldn't believe the ship looked so pretty. I couldn't. I mean, it looked like an opal. It was just because it wasn't dramatically lit when I was working on it, and these guys lit it for drama, you know, for effect. And yeah, to man, bring it, bring out all the detail. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you get goosebumps. Uh, you know it. I, I get goosebumps just talking about it now. I, it was stunning. So you know, it kind of makes yeah. you feel like you're walking on air. Yeah, there's there. It's it's just so nice to get a uh, a chance and and have people have you come out now more in the public hall and talk about all this because there's been a a sort of a raging debate for years about how the model was really painted and how much uh, you could really see that iridescent paintwork on the model. Some people claim it was. Uh, barely noticeable, and it was meant to be very subdued. And other people have said that, well, it's it was the way it was originally painted was meant to be very pronounced and definitely noticeable. And and didn't they have to make some adjustments to the paintwork or something due to the uh, techniques they were using for transferring it all to film? And it was causing some of the reflections or something were causing some interference or something like that. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't to the paintwork, Boyd. It was. Um, <clears throat> I mean, Doug came up to me, and we were all standing there with our mouths agape, uh, and he said, Paul, you know, it's beautiful. He said, but I, I think, you know, we're going to get some light kicks off the brightness, excuse me, the reflections and everything, and so we're, we're not going to be able to light it the way we want to, which makes the colors iridesce. Um, <clears throat> And because, you know, you have to pull an even edge on the model to isolate it from its background uh, to make a mat. And because, I mean, as you know, Boyd, I mean, the, the model has, you know, when you spray all those different colors, you've got every color in the rainbow you're looking at. So you can't use green screen or blue screen or any other screen, color screen, to drop out the background because it'll also drop out whatever... A color is that matches that's on the ship. That ah, matches yes. Uh huh. It drops it out. So it, it's like a, a weatherman who's standing on a blue screen with behind him. If he wears a blue tie, you'll see whatever is showing up in the background, you'll see it coming through his tie. His tie will drop out. So Doug had to use a technique called white screen, where he, when he shot the model, you have uh, a bipack pass of orthographic film, an orthographic black and white film, 
is film that when it's exposed either goes clear or it stays black. It, there's no gray values in it at all. Um, and that's a, uh, that's a film that's used for a lot of printing purposes where you want either you want clear film or you want black areas. And so what they would do is they would bypack in the camera positive orthographic film and negative orthographic film. And they would shoot a pass on the camera with the model st stood in front of a white, uh, brightly lit background screen. So the model was in silhouette. And so what you would get with that in, in the negative film, you would get a, uh, a, a window of the model with black all around it that you could drop the beauty pass of the model into and then you would get with the opposite one you would get a black an outline of the model that, and a clear background where you could drop the background into and so the beauty pass of the model when you shot that if it was too brightly lit you would get light kicks off the edge and even with the matte it would it would the mat trapping all that extra light it doesn't trap at all you would still get a bit of glare and you wouldn't get a nice clean edge from the model to the its background and you would see that it, it just wouldn't look right so they had to they just couldn't use bright lighting that would make the colors iridesce the way the model actually looked which was a real shame so they had to they had to keep the light down low but they didn't. Um, they didn't kill any of the colors. It was just low lighting. Okay. Well, that's yeah. That's very interesting, and I think that'll help clear up a lot of that discussion that's going going on amongst people in the hobby and enthusiasts for years and years. Right. Kind of going. Uh, you know, um, I think there. I think there is some documentation out there that once they got to Star Trek II, uh, rather than uh, rather than. Uh, working with all the lighting things to do it because a lot of us feel that the model was never filmed as beautifully as it was since the original the motion picture they they just uh, they just didn't treat it as special with the filming of the model and highlight it as much on some of the later films as they did but they uh, apparently at some point they went back and sprayed some things over your original work and to, to try to tone it down and uh, yeah, they, no, that they was on a very the heavy film. matte coat on it yeah, that was on the second film. They had mm -hmm. to because ILM used uh, green screen. And, of course, there's a lot of green in the model. Um, and so they had to knock it all, all back. Uh, so I, you know, I don't know um, what they actually used, but uh, I've only just seen some shots of the model as it is today. And... There's still a lot of my paintwork there. It's just knocked way back. Right. Yeah, we've all uh, shared pictures. There's a few spots on the top of the saucer there by where the uh, the big number is there on the top where some of your original panels are still there, and you can see them perfectly clear. Yeah. And a couple of the little tiny, on, on the edge of the dish, there's a couple of little squares that are, uh, they left those alone as well because they, at no point, are they used as an edge against the background? They're always against the the ship itself. I see. So then they were able to leave those. Well, you seem to know a lot about the filmmaking process, Paul. Did you be find yourself becoming interested in being uh, maybe not having worked a lot on films before you got involved with that project? Did that whole process kind of interest you when you were working on that and learning well, about mean, how they did all that? Well, my dad, as I explained in the book, I, I, my dad was uh, uh, an amateur photographer and always interested in photography. And even though he was a bus driver, uh, not making any money, um, he, he bought a Super 8 camera, or well, an 8 millimeter camera when they, you know, when they were first available, really. And uh, so he developed my interest in photography. Yuck, yuck. And um, so I, I learned how to process my own film when I was 12, 13 years old. Um, and, you know, I had an enlarger and I, you know, did all that stuff and I understood film. And then when I started doing posters, um, I worked for a printing company, a big printing company in, in quality control. And so I got to understand the whole printing process, which photography fits into at the beginning stages. 
Um, and uh, so I put all that together with being able to use an airbrush and learning special effects techniques, film techniques back then, which were really developed back in the 30s. I mean, nothing had really changed all that much in, in effects work, uh, film effects, opticals, and everything. Um, that, I mean, Mac cameras and optical techniques uh, were that we used in the 70s were not any different than what we used in the 30s. We just had better film stock and That's better amazing. cameras. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was all that same uh, technique of using... Um, uh, pushing film to its limits, what you could do with film, and using different layers of film and combining different layers of film and opticals in a Mac camera to get a finished result. And I understood all that, and uh, so then I developed a technique where I could do, uh, way before you could do this on computers, where I could do logos and titles in all different colors on Cibachrome paper, uh, and I could develop it myself in my kitchen. And uh, I had a color enlarger, and uh, a super chromega and larger, and I had different filters, and I could use uh, uh, colored filters with black and white film and on color paper, and make whatever I wanted. And then if the if the client wanted the logo in green as opposed to red, I could just go back in and and change the filter and and do it in in green uh, without destroying the artwork, which couldn't be done up till then. So. That got me into movie titles and um, using that same technique, you know, that I did on the Abyss and Terminator 2 and Back to the Future and all that stuff and Robocop and then that was still all done with film and opticals before computers could handle it. Wow, amazing! Yeah, that's a uh, really good information, Paul. How long do you think that it uh, took you overall to finish your work on the model? And then maybe explain or uh, share some of the uh, things that you recall about. Other things that occurred, uh, there was a nice uh, sort of, a, well, not really nice, but a story in your book where you mentioned a mishap that happened on the model while it was in, uh, right after it had been finished, where some, some water damage occurred on the model. I think a lot of people would be interested to hear about that. Uh, okay, sorry, what was the first part of your question? Uh, um, uh, basically, how long do you remember it took you to complete uh, your paintwork on it, Paul? Well, it was, it, it took about six months, and the first the first month was working 10 hours a day, five days a week. But then after that, it was 16, 17, 18 hours a day, seven days a week, flat out. And, and that took six months. And then when somebody came in and tripped the circuits the wrong way and blew all the lights in the dish, then that had to be changed. And then that took another two months to get all that straightened out. Um, but... Um, so, you know, that was, it was a total of eight months, but it was really a six-month job. Wow. And, the, oh, the other bit was, um, when I was working on uh, on the special effects, then uh, Mark uh, told me, which he explains on the videos, um, that whilst they were, they had a day off or a weekend off, and Mark can't remember what it must have been, but maybe the 4th of July or something, um, when they were shooting the model, and there, uh, up in the ceiling, 20 feet up, was an air conditioning duct that had malfunctioned, or maybe it was real hot outside. Anyway, some water was condensing, and it dripped right onto the bridge, of all wow. places. And yeah. The, uh, uh, Mark told me that the bridge, the original bridge, was made of wood, and um, uh, and even though it was everything was covered in paint, the water somehow leached in to the wood. And when they came in the next morning, the the bridge had popped off the model and taken part of the paint with it, you know, all raggedy bits and everything. Oh, disaster, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, and they're in the middle of a uh, shooting schedule. So uh, Mark pulled two 36-hour uh, all-nighters, 36 hours straight without sleep, to form a new bridge, and he was able to give it much more detail. And he made it in whatever he made it in, some kind of plastic. Uh, he explains it in, in, in the videos. Um, mm -hmm. And so he pulled 
two 36 hours and slept for 12 or 14 hours and then came back and did the next one and then um, made a new bridge and then it was up to Ron to then paint it and meld it into the rest of the top of the saucer and, and get all the sanding done and you know make it an invisible transition into the paint that was on the top of the saucer. So that was a major uh, 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 problem they had and so that took well, if you two times 36, 72, and then Ron reckons he pulled another 36 hour one. So you're probably looking at a week and a bit. Wow. Well, I think that's a good reminder to everyone, Paul, that uh, it's not all glamour in Hollywood. It's really, really hard work. It's hard work. And, and, and I'll tell you what, uh, I am, I grew up in San Francisco, and everybody in San Francisco always looked down their noses at people in LA. And when I lived in LA, I realized that you know people in San Francisco were really arrogant and stuffy and full of themselves and people in LA really knew what the hell they were doing and behind the camera especially boy you've got you've got such skilled um, talented experienced people doing very highly technical stuff at the very highest level who are just phenomenal at what they can do and uh, I, and any good movie has people of that caliber on it, and it's it's very impressive to work with people of such skill and talent. That's incredible, Paul. And I wanted to mention everybody that uh, in Paul's book, and if you uh, purchase Paul's book or his his e version of the book, which is an online book or his paperback uh, book, that there are uh, you'll be provided with links that will take you to some very exclusive video interviews he's got with his friends that he worked on the movie with that take you to some very in-depth details about uh, pretty much the entire scope of how the model was conceived, built, finished, filmed, everything. So people and that are interested in that. stories about Gene Roddenberry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> very interesting stories about Gene Roddenberry. Yeah. And uh, very fascinating material. Now, uh, Paul, what describe to us what it was like uh, for you the first time you actually got down and uh, we're, we're able to see the finished movie and what was your feeling seeing your work up on the big screen like that? Um, well I had um, I had uh, in the course of working on the film I met an English girl uh, who was on uh, on holiday and touring around America and fell in love with her um, and uh, so we decided to get married in November of 79 and the film came out uh, Christmas of 79 and uh, so we got married over here in England um, my friend Gary Brooker who wrote and sang Wider Shade of Pale was, owned a pub which is now just 600 yards up the road from where I'm living at the moment um, he doesn't own it now but he owned it then and he said look Paul why don't you get married over here um, there's a wonderful 14th century church just up the road hidden in the woods it's really cute and then we'll put on a big spread for you and you can have the reception at the para and uh, so I left the film at the end of September and uh, before it was finished but I mean everybody was working like night and day because then it takes a long time to make all the prints of the film you know you have to edit everything and then you have to get all those prints out there to get distributed around the world and uh, so my then wife and I we were only married for three years but you know at the time we had just come back from our honeymoon and um, I had the jacket on but it didn't have any signatures on it at that point and um, we went to the premiere at Leicester Square in London where they have all the big premieres in, in England and uh, it knocked me out I mean I cuz I didn't I didn't know what the we didn't they didn't let us see any of the live action to be able to tuck in our special effects to because they were embarrassed by them because they didn't think they were very good and they, they didn't want to let any of that out and uh, so we were working blind and so nobody had any idea what the film was going to look like uh, so it was, you know, it was fascinating. I mean, just to, I mean, I knew what, what the some of the shots were, some of the beauty shots of the Enterprise, but I didn't know how they fit into the movie at all. So it was absolutely a delight 
uh, for me, you know, to watch it. And it was just, there it was. And I thought, here I am in London, and mm, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> and the people in the audience probably didn't have any idea, most of them, that uh, they're sitting with right next to the guy that yeah. that did the job. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's interesting. Well, Paul, I know that you... Uh, uh, Mention that would it be okay for, to have a few of our panelists here ask their own questions to you. So I think we're going to open it up to that now. I've yeah. been talking too much and asking too many questions. So anybody no, I've else? Been talking, I've been talking too much, boy. <laughs> oh, well, we're enjoying every minute of it, Paul. Uh, <laughs> does anybody here have anything they want to ask Paul themselves? If you guys do, take it away. Okay. Well, first, I have two questions for you, Paul. Yeah. Uh, it's been the so some of the descriptions of using the paint in Star Trek the Motion Picture, it said I've read that said uh, flocal paint was used on every miniature, but the Enterprise. What kind of paint was used on the Enterprise if it wasn't flocal? No, no, no. The the iridescent paint was made by a, a small company. I'm sure they're long gone, called Crescent. And uh, but the strong back section. Um, Good job, that Paul. <laughs> Ron, <laughs> that Ron did um, was Floquo. Interesting. And number two. But but but, but the the Floquo paints back then had a very weird uh, their own thinner. It was really weird stuff. But Ron said it laid down beautifully. Apparently now Floquo are all acrylic. Mm, actually, it's enamel. They. Oh, okay, enamel. Well, but they weren't enamels; they were something else back then. Because it was you had to buy there; you couldn't use a, an enamel. What's a thinner for enamel? Um, I use Lowe's. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But the 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 thinner for the quote flow quote back then, mm -hmm. you couldn't use uh, regular paint thinner. Okay. That didn't work. You had to buy their paint thinner, and it, a lacquer didn't work. Lacquer thinner didn't work. Paint thinner didn't work. Um, you had to use the flow coil thinner, but they've changed their formula apparently. Mm -hmm. And the second question I want to ask you: How did you become involved with uh, doing the Terminator credits? Uh, I, 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 okay, um, Terminator. I after after Star Trek and. When I had learned more about how uh, special effects were done using film, and I understood film, but I just didn't understand how effects were done using film, mm -hmm. and then applying airbrush techniques to that, how I could tone um, black and white film, and then using colored light on colored film or colored paper, make any tone color I, 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 uh, I wanted, uh, and and thus producing, um, well, anything really, in in various colors. And if the client wanted it in blue instead of green or purple, I could go back and do it using the same artwork. I just had to make a different exposure. Um, and so, using having that developed that technique, which only one other guy, a friend of mine, had developed as well. And he had worked on Star Trek as well uh, with John Dykstra. And we both kind of came up with the same idea at the same time. And uh, I, was, I was doing some film titles with a, a small camera service in Burbank called Animagic. And uh, he got a, a lot of title work, low-budget title work in. And uh, so I worked with him. And... When I, I, I showed up one night to bring him some artwork, and there was a guy there named Ernie Farino uh, who had designed the first Terminator title. And they were having all kinds of problems because the, 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 the letters Terminator cross in front of each other as the film opens up like that. Mm -hmm. And you get mat lines you, where you, you're, you're dropping out clear areas and then trapping them with a dark area. And there's no way you can absolutely get those things to fit in film when you've got 24 frames a second going through a, a gate and it's all jumping around and you get all this shatter. Um, and it was causing them a nightmare. And so I, I helped them. We were staying up all night. And I, I was just there as a third hand, you know, to move dials and 
move the optical camera and change things and whatever while they were trying to solve their problems. And then, um, so I had met Ernie, and Ernie knew Jim Cameron really well. And, uh, you know, it's who you know in life uh, when it comes to, you know, professional stuff. And, uh, and then Jim asked Ernie um, to do the, uh, the Abyss, and Ernie was directing his own film, and he said, look, I've got a friend of mine, you know, who helped me on the, on the first Terminator title. Um, why don't you talk to him? And so then I got a phone call from Jim's secretary, you know, saying, can I come down? I brought my stuff, and Jim told me what he wanted for the title, and so I designed the title, and we shot it at Pacific Title, and, uh, and that was a nightmare. And a uh, simple title, but it was very, very difficult. And then, um, so having done that, then when Jim did Terminator 2, he called Ernie again. And Ernie said, no, I, Jim, I'm, I've got another movie I'm directing, you know. Um, call Paul. You know, he did a good job on the Abyss. Sorry, I've got a mosquito here. And um, he said, call Paul. And uh, so then Jim called me, and I went down and showed him, uh, you know, my ideas. We talked about it, and I storyboarded up the, the title and then went back. And so I did the trailer. Uh, so I came up with the trailer and directed the trailer and then and did the trailer title and then uh, did the main title because I had done the trailer title and we used the same we used the same artwork and we just colored it differently for the main title. It was one of the most uh, how do I put this one of the most brilliant credits to a movie I've ever seen because with the Terminator coming right at you with the red eyes and the flame and then at the end the steel bar shut showing the truck. Oh it's well that's absolutely brilliant. Well it's interesting you say that because <laughs> you just reminded me. Um, I came up with it oh and I I didn't I left the storyboards at uh, this one outfit and they disappeared and I should have grabbed them back. They're the best storyboards I've ever done, and it, I, God knows where they are now. But um, anyway, I came up with a whole main title sequence to lead you into the movie, um, where there's the kids playing on the swings, and um, and Jim really liked it, and he said, "But Paul, he said, look, uh, you know, if I had my way, I wouldn't have any." main titles. I just go straight into my movie. He said, I, I know I need a main title, uh, but he said it's just too much because I led it up to where all that comes together, uh, and it's the grill of the truck. Um, and uh, Jim said, look, you know, it's great, Paul, and, and we argued it back and forth. He said, no, it's got to be shorter, you know, so we, we shortened it right down. And, uh, but it wasn't right. It, it, it just you know, went clang, clang, and then the truck, and I said, no, Jim, you know, we, we need something here. And he was getting frustrated. He said, what? It's okay the way it is, you know. And I said, what's the, you know, what's the most powerful image in the film? And unbelievably, he, and Jim's a really smart guy, and he looked at me, and he, he just went blank. And I said, the Terminator, the skull. I said, have the skull come through the flames and you're into the movie, you know. And he went, of course. And so that's what we did. Well, I for one want to thank you because, like I said, it's one of my favorite opening titles for a... Oh, well. Well, thank you. I've got... Well, I, uh, actually, it's if, definitely really, really cool. Um, if you hang on just for a second, I've, uh, the guys at Pacific Title made a little thing for me. I'll show you. I've got it up on... Have I got it? Yeah, hang on. I don't know you got, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm loving every minute of this, guys. <laughs> um, oh, they, wow. they, made up, they, wow. they made up a composite of the title, so it's the doors are are partially shut, shutting, but um, they did a, a well. You can't. They're getting a lot of reflection here. We can see it pretty good, Paul. We can okay. see it. Yeah. Um, and that was uh, when I moved to England in '91. In uh, no, it's '80. When did they give this to me? Let me have a look here. 
Yeah, 91. Um, when I moved to England in 91, and, and the guys at Pacific Title, I'd done a lot of work with them, uh, and they they mocked this up for me and, and gave me this as a going away present. That's wonderful, Paul. Yeah, that's so with cool. my film credit on it, you know, it's nice. Yeah, Thanks really so much is. for <clears throat> sharing all that with us. Yeah, I, I don't think there's uh, maybe a lot of people that know that you were even involved with that. That's really cool. Well, I, yeah, I've done a lot of film titles. Um, if you look on the on the website, there's uh, I I open one of my plan drawers and there's a bunch of you can see a bunch of that Cibachrome work um, that has uh, that I I was able to create before you could do stuff like that on a computer. Did really I hear cool. you say you did Robocop as well, or the design uh, of the staff? I did Robo I did Robocop too. Okay. I did Delta Force two. I did I did lots of twos. Um, oh, I probably fifty or sixty film titles. Wow, in, incredible! In, in fact, um, uh, I did. Uh, I had a a, a rep, a, a illustrator uh, rep, uh, English woman, who um, called me up uh, five o'clock in the afternoon. She said, "Paul, I need a title by tomorrow morning." Uh, for a movie, if I curry her over the artwork, uh, can you do it? Stay up all night, you know. And uh, I said, what's the budget? She said, well, $3,000. I said, I'll stay up all night. <laughs> and um, uh, so she curried over the, the artwork, and I got everything ready, and I stayed up all night. I, I did the title and the motorcyclist came in the morning and went straight out to the airport and they sent it up north apparently I didn't know where it was going and it was a it was a movie called Explorers <laughs> you know that film Are you familiar with that movie yeah. Explorers is one of my favorite films you oh. did the titles for Explorers yeah I, I did the title and but here's the funny bit it was just one of you know you're working and stuff comes through the door and you do it and it goes out. It's just like the people who work on Casablanca. Warner Brothers did 200 and some odd films that year. And nobody knew that that was going to be, they, it was just another film in the works, you know, and they did it and they knocked it out and all of a sudden it's one of the greatest films ever made. But they didn't know that at the time. It was just one of the movies that came through the, the workshop. <clears throat> so I was doing the same thing. You know, I would get work, it would come in, it would go out. It, that's basically what Star Trek was, really, and um, so, and because you don't know, you know, you're not thinking ahead in that way. You're just thinking on to the next project, and you know, paying your mortgage or whatever. <clears throat> so, about a year later, two years later, I'm watching a movie in the afternoon, and uh, this friend of mine worked at ILM. She worked for George. She was George. She wasn't his PA, but. <clears throat> she arranged um, anyone who wanted to use Skywalker Ranch. She was the point to get them in to uh, uh, do all their soundtracks and everything, because Skywalker Ranch is the sound facility for Lucasfilm. And she works. She still works there. And uh, so I, uh, her name is Susan Leahy, and she gets lots of credits on... on uh, uh, Lucasfilm on uh, films that are done with I, at ILM, and um, so I'm watching this movie, but I hadn't seen the beginning. I just missed the beginning, and I turned it on. It was this charming film, and it was obvious it was made up in Northern California. It there's a different mentality up there than there was down in Hollywood, and so I just knew that uh, Lucasfilm had done it, and so I call Susan up in the middle of the film. And I said, Susan, I'm watching this wonderful, wonderful movie and about these. She said, what's it about? And I said, about these kids and everything, you know. And I said, you know, I would love, this is the kind of movie I would love to have had something to do with. And um, she said, oh, really? And I said, yeah. I said, y you know, I, I just love films like this. And um, she said, Paul, I got to go. And she hung up the phone. <laughs> and I thought that was, and that wasn't like Susan. And, um, oh, no, she, before she said that, she said, um, Paul, I got to go. Uh, call me when the movie's over. Hung up the phone. And I thought, that was unlike Susan. Uh, she's always very polite. I, so I continued watching the movie. And at the end of the movie, they showed the, the opening title again. One of the few movies that's ever done that. And there was 
my title coming up. <laughs> and I just broke up laughing. <laughs> I called her up. And she saw my phone number on there. She picked it up and she was giggling, you know. She said, well, <laughs> you had something to do with it. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody else have any questions or thoughts they want to share with Paul? Well, Boyd, I'd like to bring up one. Uh, Adam uh, had a question from before when we did this. He wanted to know, specifically asked Paul, about the type of masking materials he used um, to paint the Enterprise. Okay. Okay, I only used um, two kinds. I used magic tape, uh, three-quarter inch wide magic tape, you know, scotch magic tape, low tack. <clears throat> and for that, that was mainly for the fuselage. And then I used uh, five thousandths uh, thick acetate sheets. Oh, okay. So, uh, simple as that. Those uh, were the only two. That answers his question quite nicely. So. Um, now, you guys, it, it, with all the people you're in touch with, if you if you can, anyone who has any questions, forget ones that I, I've answered, but about the design of the model or the building of the Enterprise, uh, if you would collect them up so that when I go back in April, I'm going back at the end of March, I've already booked my flight, I expect I'll be in LA sometime around mid-April uh, to meet with uh, Jim and Richard and Mark and Ron again, but certainly with at least with Richard and Jim um, to tie up any loose ends, you know, that anything somebody wants to know that wasn't covered in the interviews. Oh, oh, absolutely, Paul. We uh, will definitely be working on right. that. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and, and uh, it, it's just been uh, fascinating to learn about all this stuff, and, and sort of hearing it will sort of lead to, to more things that we can think of, I think, going down the road as far yeah. as uh, adding to all of that. Well, I'm, you know, I'm around. <laughs> well, we're we're really enjoying this whole thing. Well, Paul, it looks like there in the background that you've uh, you've got some some mementos from the from the film. Could you uh, uh, well, show not, us a few of those and uh, well, explain them I, a little bit? I've only got this one, um, which I grabbed uh, before I left, and. Uh, RANA is Robert Abel and Associates, um, and Star Trek personnel only, and that was um, uh, that was on going on to the shooting stage for the wow, model. Wow, incredible! That is really nice. So it's on, you know, silk screen on metal. There were probably four or five of those scattered around the building. Yeah. And I just nicked one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then in the, the background there, Paul, you've got your uh, your crew jacket that were made up specially for people that were working on the film at the time. Is that correct? Yeah. That, well, what uh, this was just Doug's uh, uh, our bunch, and I think um, there were about uh, I think there were sixty two or sixty three of them made. And most of them were bought by the model makers and the engineers and and the secretaries and you know, um, and I got mine. And uh, I know Ron and Mark got their signed by uh, Shatner and Nimoy, but because I left and I was supposed to get mine done, but because I left for England to get married, I didn't get mine signed. And uh, so. I always wanted to catch up with that, and so at the at the London Star Trek thing, you know, that moved me to write the book. Um, then I met up with William, and so I got him to sign it there. And uh, I spoke at a uh, at a um, uh, at the James Doohan um, tribute in 2004 in Hollywood because I was living in L.A. at the time. So I got George Takai to sign it, and again. Part of my deal for speaking there um, was uh, to get Leonard and, and uh, William to sign it, and they had come and left the building before the girls had realized that, oops, I was supposed to meet them, and so they would sign the jacket, so I missed out on that. But I got George's there, and then on the front, I've got, at the same time, I got Walter Koenig's. 
there. Wow. Yeah. And then, then when I went to L.A., uh, I signed it, and then um, Mark Stetson signed it, and then uh, Richard Taylor, who designed the Enterprise, there in red, and then Jim Dow, who built it, signed it on the front, and then Ron Gress, who painted the strong back. <laughs> <laughs> You've got that down pat now, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> um, signed it. So, um, so there's just one signature to get, and that's Leonard's. And um, it's beautiful, Paul. Is it? It looks like it's all silk. It's it's cotton satin. Um, oh, which is okay. Real delicate stuff. Dry cleaners don't want to go near it. It's incredible um, you've kept it in that beautiful condition all this time. And I've worn it a few times as well. You know, when we, when the movie came out, I wore it around London for a couple of weeks. Because, you know, it was the movie of the... Of oh, the, sure. Right, yeah. cool. You know, strut around. And, but, um, uh, and so, at some point, if I can get the book out there, I've got... Uh, I'm, I sent it to an agent in New York who... Um, uh, she says she's got two authors who have written Star Trek stories, and they've, they've been published by Simon & Schuster, and apparently Simon & Schuster are the Star Trek publishers in America. Mm -hmm. They've got a Star Trek department. And so she has a, an in. So we'll see if she likes the book enough to uh, approach them. And if I can, if I can kind of get out there a bit, then what I want to do is auction off the jacket and the uh, and the decal sheet. And, you know, the decal sheet? I mean, I, I, speaking, I can, of the, speaking of the decal sheet, Paul, could you give us yeah. another look at that? Oh, yes, yeah. please. Wow, would you look at that, <laughs> wow. everybody. Oh, my God. You can, you can tell by that right there that it that's made to fit on a big model. <laughs> big, big model. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. And, and that has survived all this time, Paul. That's amazing. It's the last Thank one. You. So you know, much for showing us that. Paul, yes. I have to I have to give you an idea. I know yeah. you said you're going to auction that, but you ought to consider having some photographic prints made of it because I'd be your first customer lined up to to buy a print without question. Uh, what, a jaclay, like a big... Uh, a, a, an actual size you clay? Yeah, the one-to-one uh, -one scale photo reproduction yeah. of that. Yeah, I would be so, yeah, without question. You, 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 that is an excellent idea. I would love to have a copy of that, too, a lithograph or something I could hang up on my wall. Yeah, that would be incredible. Okay, well, that would be really nice. Okay, I'll tell you what. Um, I'll be um, there. I mean, everything over here in England is so much more expensive than it is in America. Uh -huh. I mean, every, every th everything is because we've got... 20% sales tax. Um, the fuel cost to deliver anything is two or three times what it is in America. So that all gets built into any service you buy, you know, anything you buy. Um, but I'll find out what a Jacle, uh print would cost. Because that's the only way it can be done, you know, on a big, unless I can find somebody with like a big printer that takes big rolls of paper. You know, because it would look nice on on glossy paper because that's kind of what it, what it's on there. Yeah, right. high quality photo stock. Yeah, so um, I'll ask around and then see what it costs to get something like that printed up. That would be wonderful, yeah. Paul. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me get that down. Yeah, that'd be neat. I'd be down for one. Matt, yeah, did you have anything you wanted to ask Paul? <laughs> I I was just wondering, have you ever thought about building one of these polar lights kits and, and painting it up the same way? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> no. I, no, I really, you know, I've got so many other things that, I, I mean, if I'm going to do any airbrushing, I'm going to airbrush some of my paintings. You know, I'm going to make paintings. But, um, but doing a, a smaller model, you know, the smaller the model is, the more difficult. The here, bigger here. something is. <laughs> we know exactly. that. We know about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, 
and I, you know, I've seen on some of your YouTube videos, boy, that you were talking about doing things in a month or two, and I just can't imagine that. Yeah. I'm a little bit crazy, Paul. Uh, yeah, or <laughs> you're very, very skilled. <laughs> Boyd, well, Boyd's the fastest modeler alive, man. Well, well uh, Paul, I was just going to mention a while ago when I asked you the question about the uh, areas that were difficult to paint on the model for me. It's the engines because uh, no, you've you got know, to wrap right. all these things around all and you've cells. got all these complex shapes that you're trying to go over and you're trying to keep it all nice and clean. And on a smaller no. scale like that, it's it's that was to me the hardest part to paint. Now, I, after I said that, uh, then I was thinking, actually, the nacelles were pretty tricky. Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah, so you're dead right. Yeah, no, the, the nacelles, I mean, the, the back part of the nacelles were great, uh, but the... You know the front part of the cells with all those compound curves and everything. Yeah, they were that. Well, that was tricky because even on the big model, they're not that big. Mm hmm Right. Mm hmm I remember on the uh, videos that you were sh that you had shared with your interviews with uh, Richard that he had mentioned that that was where most of the uh, he had most sort of the most free hand in doing the redesign of the model. That the he felt like that area of the model needed to be updated and made more. I'm trying to think of what he what he said more elegant looking than the original round yeah cylinders that were on the original ship so I thought that was very interesting yeah yeah and um, uh, you know he was I mean he was really into deco stuff at the time and and I think he was talking about didn't he mention that the front of the nacelle or I can't remember what, it, but he he took some design cues off of a, like a, a a thirty-eight Ford, I think, is what he yeah. said. Yeah, exactly. You know, <laughs> right? That's very interesting. Yeah, and uh, I thought it was also interesting his his take sort of on that that being an engineer sort of a guy background that the actual beautiful ship that we think and that we that we as fans kind of all dream of that hey maybe someday they'll really make a ship like that. It's not really practical from an engineering standpoint. I, I was interested in how he was elaborating on how he thought the whole design was sort of a bit silly, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, but, but but the thing is, it, it it because it's so unusual, it's something that people can remember, and I you, you know you it's it's an iconic shape, and even the modern, you know, the all the redesigns still have to have a bit of you know th those elements in, that's in right them because that's what people recognize what mm -hmm. I never knew uh, that Richard let uh, slip was uh, his idea that um, I not in the interviews but in the book um, the concept that the saucer could detach from the fuselage right mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. which was never but, shown in any of the uh, movies with the original cast but they later on went on during some of the later television series to show quite a bit of that. Oh, did they? Yes, yes and mm -hmm. Star Trek oh, right. The Next Generation. Patrick Stewart, Emergency Saucer <laughs> Sep. <laughs> right, yeah, but I mean, Richard came up with that idea with Roddenberry um, when they were discussing it and banging heads over, you know, that whole business about the 12-foot circular doors. And... Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wanted to mention that, too, from reading the book and watching the interviews and everything, that for people that are looking for every scrap of information about Gene Roddenberry and things. There's some really good stuff in there about Gene Roddenberry yeah. and uh, how he dealt with certain things and how he was pretty hard to convince, it seems, sometimes to change from what his actual vision of all that should be. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And probably uh, I think it would be a good idea to uh, get Richard to bring him out more about that on the interviews. You know, Absolutely. On the yeah, interview. people will be fascinated yeah. by that, Paul. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, anybody who's already bought the book still will get access to all the new stuff. So, you know, it'll be an expanding thing, as, and as people contribute more than, you know. Um, like, I've got a bunch of stuff that Jim left me, which I haven't, I haven't posted on the website. I'll run through them real quick. No, that's. Oh, I don't think I've ever seen a picture of the of the travel pod before ever when it was being yeah, worked on. Yeah, I've that's, never seen that picture. Uh, that's Chris Ross. I'll I'll get these up on. The, I've, I've scanned them. I just haven't done it. 
And there's Jim and Susanna. Back oh, then. On, on the on the Klingon ship. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I'll tell you what, nice that Klingon picture. ship that, that was really a beautiful model. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we love that one too. Yeah, yeah, I I really liked it. Um I don't know what this is. What's that part of the dry dock frame? Yeah, yeah, it's part of the dry dock frame, yeah. It might, it might be the original dock, dry dock. Before yeah, the they, one that was canceled. Exactly. And um, here's, I don't know this guy's name, but that was before I got there. Oh, I've never, these are, I don't think any of these have ever been published. I've never yeah, seen them. I have these. never seen them. That's a really nice photograph of the, you can see the, with him working on the nacelle. Yeah, yeah, it looks like they're mounting it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've scanned them. Out. It, it's just a matter of, uh, they'll all be on Jim Dow's page. It's just a matter of my, you know, adding it to the website. Oh, wow. Whoa. That's wow. where you can really get an idea of how big that saucer was. The scale. Yeah. yeah. It is actually, to actually see a, a picture without the bridge deck uh, on there and with the saucer still open like that, I, that's really amazing. I've never seen a photo like that. Well, Wonderful that. stuff, Paul. And there's Chris Ross and this other guy again. That might be Greg Jean. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's an excellent photograph. I want that model. <laughs> <laughs> we call that kind of thing model porn. <laughs> yeah, that's what we call that. <laughs> and here's a detail of um, the, I guess, the dry dock light. Oh, oh yeah! Wow, that's, that's a great picture for detail. Yeah, wonderful picture. And of course, I mean, this is all before LEDs and everything. Yeah, you know, so that's right. the other thing they were dealing with is heat buildup. You know, with uh, incandescent bulbs and all that. Right. Um, and then wow, well, this is. Now I don't I don't get this picture um, because this is a ship in the dry dock before I painted it, and I didn't think they had the dry dock finished, but maybe they did. Oh yeah! Wow, beautiful, very nice. So that's got um, and what's this? Oh, here you go. There's the fuselage. Oh yeah! Wow. Now is that is that one of your pictures, Paul? It looks like there's uh, some of your. No, pictures. no. That's when you were when you were masking it, or they were doing some other, or maybe it was a no, strong no, back. No, no. This is while they're building it. They're this build is while oh, they're building it. Wow. This is this is before I got involved. Wow. Hmm. Paul, I'm here to tell you those are some rare pictures. Nobody's ever seen those before. Well, I, no, I know Jim. Uh, he handed me this this folder, and he said. He said, "Here, Paul, I've, I've got some stuff I collected for you." He's got tons of stuff, but if I mean, if Jim had been to the and spoken at the at the exhibition I did, the convention I did here in London, he would have been. I it would have stopped him dead, and he, I think he would have realized, "Wait a minute." I have a lot of valuable stuff here, and I need to get it out. And he's only getting it secondhand from me, you see, and uh -huh. because he didn't have the experience of all those people <clears throat> Doesn't from all over the world. Uh, where are we here? Which way is that? Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Incredible. There you can see a shot of the of the rear armature that they were talking about going into yep. the shuttle bay it looks like yeah yeah that's yep. it yeah mm -hmm. wow i'm amazed i thought that was interesting this how they talked about how scary that was to set that up like that oh, oh yeah when when the you whole think, thing is just sitting at the end of this pole yeah exactly that's when you don't want to bump into it there you can see some interior detail on the travel pod oh outstanding it is outstanding that is a beautiful photograph too and and then here are some of the layups for 
um, the engine of cells. Oh. The molds. Oh, I'm, I'm amazed. I have never seen a picture of any of the molds for that. Hmm. Wow. Oh, man. And you know, you know what? Jim that's told, amazing. Jim told me that just last year he threw out almost all the molds, and he had them in his attic, and he got rid of them. No. Oh. No, I know. I know. Oh, it's hard. Really. Just, just, I mean, it would, you know, if it was 25 years ago, okay, but it was just last year, just before yeah. I contacted him after having. Oh, man. I, 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 that might be the, the gar same part. The garbage guy had no idea what he was hauling away that day, that's for sure. No kidding. Exactly. Man. And then... Wow. Mm. Oh, my Lord. That's just amazing. These are those. All this stuff is uh, priceless treasures, Paul. It really is. Um, and then, um, so there are those. And then, I mean, he could have made a fortune off of castings for for modeling fans that would have paid big bucks off the castings off those molds. Exactly. I mean, that would have been because there's very few science fiction models that is that is loved more than this particular model. Oh, look at that. Yeah. That's a beautiful photo. Like I like I I was thinking a while back too that when they built that model they probably never would have imagined that that same model would have been used for 13 years making films. No. No, of course not. I mean, like I said, I mean, we thought um, we thought it would be in the at, at the Air and Space Museum in, in uh, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's a similar photo. Those are excellent. Man. The guy yeah. on the right does look like Greg Jean. Yeah, so that's probably Greg Jean. And, and uh, no, the, this guy, yeah, the guy, this guy is Chris Ross. Mm -hmm. But I never knew. The guy Greg. with the blue shirt, I think, is, it, it looks, looks like Greg like Jean. Yeah, that yeah. probably is. Yeah, so this would be 1978, My, wow. maybe even late, maybe even late 77. And there's the last one. Incredible. You know, I have over a thousand photographs of that model, and I, and it's just amazing. It's a real treat to see photographs I've never seen before, especially the pre-production uh, production photographs like this. Yeah. 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 And and the thing is, I've been trying to get hold of Virgil Morano, who um, uh, was the uh, still photographer hired by Paramount. And Virgil um, took, I mean, he took all the eight by ten ectochrome transparencies of the ship. Now they all, you know, that is all Paramount property. But I've written to him on LinkedIn and he hasn't answered me and I know Mark sees him and I'm, I'm going to lean on Mark to try and get Virgil to write to me to see if he's got because he'll have some pictures of the of the ship brightly lit with all the iridescence and everything I know he will um, but, oh wow uh, and and those pictures will just be incredible because yeah. I remember I remember seeing some of them and they were all numbered and you couldn't you know you could you you couldn't take him away. You could look at him while on a light box while he was stood there, and then he took him back into the. He had a lab on site, and everything was all locked up. You know, Paramount were really nuts about security. Uh huh. So um, yeah, but I know there's some really somewhere there are some really spectacular photographs, dramatically lit, without the star background, but with just a black background. Oh. Um, Incredible, man, it would, man. incredible it reference would be, material. Yeah. yeah, but it would be incredible to see photographs just as she was real, originally painted and everything, and with all the iridescence popping, that yeah. would be that would be amazing to see. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it really it, it it was a very pretty model. It, it it's just such a shame that you know it's been ruined. Um, but maybe you know maybe with a bunch of people getting together and you know, putting it out there and finding the guy who owns it and putting it to him. Like, you know, you spent quarter of a million, spend another quarter of a million, you have something that's priceless. Yeah, like, absolutely, yeah. You know. If anything I, ever deserved to be saved, that's definitely one of them. Yeah. yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Well, saved, shot. restored, and I mean, Star Trek fans and model building fans. I mean, that that's that's a model that you know to see is an amazing model, and to have it restored back to its original condition would be wonderful. I mean, I, I know that if if that model was brought into uh, the conventions and stuff, it would be a big star at the conventions. Oh, yeah. Without yeah. question. Oh yeah. No kidding. I, I, yeah. I can. I. I mean. You know, in, in terms of artistic value and everything, I mean, not blowing my own horn at all, but if if it was restored and somebody else painted it, um, it would look, it would still look good, but the, the, the extra value would be that the paint job was done by the guy who did the original one. Well, Absolutely. You, you, you know, Paul, the Smithsonian had hired an individual to do a restoration on the TV show model that the the big studio model that was for the yeah. television show, and, and that's in the Smithsonian. And that, the, nobody that originally ever touched the model or anything had anything really to do with it. And the restoration is the most god-awful thing on the face of the planet. The painting on it is atrocious beyond belief. And, uh, it, you know, when yourself and other people that are still uh, here that built this model uh, for the production are available. I mean, now's the time to restore the model, and in, 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 at least in a consulting role, you know, if 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 any, if if you guys don't want to do anything else, but the advantage of having you guys that can say, well, this is how it needs to be done. This is how we need to do it, and you're even available to paint it. I mean, now's the time for the restoration of that model. It'd be a shame that that uh, the owner would hire just some anybody to restore it and it'll, it'll never end up being restored the way it should be restored. And lesson learned from that is that uh, the they did the major restoration on the 11 foot TV series Enterprise model that's in the Smithsonian and it's already falling apart because they didn't oh, yeah. do a good job on it and you yeah. something like that needs to be and th- now they're talking about doing it again you know and uh, you can only hack away, so to speak, on something original yeah. like that so much. You, you're you going to do it once or twice. You better do it right, you know, so. Absolutely. And, uh, Boyd, are, are you, is there a way of, have you recorded this, or is there any way of recording this, what we're doing now? Yes, 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 we, we've been recording the whole time, Paul. Good, good, okay, well, this is, this is all important stuff, you know, because uh, <clears throat> we might be able to use some of this to kind of nudge. Um, Absolutely. Well, I can tell you, Paul, that going away from this, we have a fairly large community at Sci-Fi Model Action, and uh, this whole uh, video will be available for them to view there. And uh, we'll, I mean, you know, I run the forum over there, and I'm going to uh, start some topics and see if I can get some people interested in uh, okay. not only uh, possibly getting some work done on the uh on the studio model and getting you and some other people involved in that, but also on the convention side of things, I really think that that's uh, something that uh, a lot of the fans would really be interested in. And let's face it, I mean, the actors have been doing this uh, convention circuit for years. How much more interesting things can they say or talk about that uh, they haven't really already covered already, you know what I mean? And I think it would be interesting to start bringing in some of the production people and other important people that have some really uh, fascinating information about their involvement on the making of the movies, the models, which people are obviously very fascinated about, and uh, the designers of everything. Everybody thinks Gene Roddenberry designed everything. Well, he he did not. I mean, it's his it's his concept, and everything. But hmm. just listening to Richard and some of the other people in your videos, uh, there there's a lot more people that were involved besides Gene Roddenberry in that whole project over the years. So. And uh, people, they, they're they just scratching and clawing for every scrap of information that they, that they can get about this stuff, you know, so. Yeah, and, and as time goes on, Boyd, as things happen with, uh, you know, things that happen in the past, the further away you are from them, the more people who are interested get very interested in every bit of minutia, you know. That's, that's what's going on right now, yep. I mean, it's like, it's like, you know, I'm in the middle of writing a book about the Haight-Ashbury, and there's so much interest in it, and um, I was there, and I went through it all, and I remember it all, you know, and sure. um, and I know, you, you know, th- I mean, I've heard from people, you know, I wasn't even born then, but I wish I was, or whatever, and there are a lot of people who look back, just like they look back on the 20s, or they look back on the 1880s in Western America. Right. 
you know, and 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 just want to suck it up and and find out every little thing they can. And yep, it, so it was a know. huge cultural from a phenomenon that shaped a lot of things uh, going into the future. Yeah, a lot of different ways of looking at things and. Uh, and I mean, being that Jim is still around, Mark is still around. Um, That's I'm why around. it's so important that and they Richard are still, still around. around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. absolutely. And we've begun to lose some of the people, you know. And that's it's sad, but it's a fact of yeah. life. We've begun to lose some of the people. That's right. And you don't want to pass up on that opportunity, you know. <clears throat> talking about Star Trek again, I think one of the uh, most interesting th things I ever heard. I think they were interviewing William Shatner at one point. Yeah, and they asked him about Star Trek or something, and he said it's modern day Greek mythology, and I believe that that's absolutely true. It's it's yeah. a modern society's version of Greek mythology, and it's going to last that long, whether people think so or not. It's going to last. Uh, oh, young yeah. people, young people coming along are just as much interested in it as we were back in the from the original '60s television show. Yeah. It hasn't it hasn't gotten smaller. If anything, it's getting bigger. Oh yeah, Boyd. Um, you know, I mean, in London, 30,000 people, and uh, some of them were made up professionally. I mean, absolutely bang on. They, they could have walked on set. Uh huh. But, I mean, I met, I met a, a, a couple. I met people from all over the world who had flown from all over the world just to come to that uh, uh, show. Sure. And I met a couple... An, uh, uh, an Indian woman from Mumbai and her husband from Philadelphia. They met in uh, they met in New York. They met in New Orleans. They either met in New Orleans and got married in New York, or they met in New York and got married in New Orleans. And she had bought him VIP tickets, which were forty five hundred dollars each. Uh huh. For two and a half days, right? Forty-five hundred bucks. Oh, that—that's not a problem at all. People that love to, to Paul to people that love this stuff. And they lived they in really Kuala Lumpur. Whoa! And they flew first class, and they stayed in a five-star hotel. For example, right. if, if somebody said, like, say, my my wife and I have been married thirty years, and we don't take that many vacations or whatever. We work yeah. a lot. But uh, if I had an opportunity, for example, to say take a week vacation in Hawaii or somewhere really splendid like that or whatever, this might sound a little crazy, but if they said, well, you can either do that or you can go to a convention, say in London, and get to meet people like you or some of the cast or some other people, I don't have to think you guess very long by me being here today which where I'm going to go. I you're, mean, you're not going to you're not going to let your wife see this bit, are you? <laughs> <laughs> you won't be married much longer, boy. <laughs> oh well, yeah. She she loves this stuff as much as I do. Oh, well, in fact, she's sitting right. in the other room right now watching the stream that we're putting out here. So, Ooh. all right. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Boyd's wife. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi to Boyd's wife, right? Yeah, has she got a baseball bat handy, Boyd, by any chance? <laughs> she, yeah, you you never know, Paul. But uh, well, Paul, I think we should start winding things down here. I, I guess we'd like to close up here. I wanted to I want to bring myself up on the screen here so I can show your book again. Uh, thank you. For uh, our viewers, this is Paul's book, Creating the Enterprise, and I love uh, uh, what you wrote on here, Paul, uh, by the man who ca who gave her. A ball gown to knock the socks off, the spots off anything in the galaxy. I think that's perfectly uh, written because it really was. It really the paintwork you did on it, Paul, really is a ball gown for the majestic lady that we all know as the Enterprise. Thank you. Yeah. Well, that's how I kind of saw it when I was given the job. You know, I, I saw it. We all see ships as as female, and it was up to me to give her a ball gown. I, I mean, I thought about that when I walked in. Absolutely. And Paul, I just wanted to say to you personally, on behalf of everyone at the Sci-Fi Model Action Forums, thanks so much for doing this for us. We really, really appreciate it. It's been I absolutely enjoy. fascinating, and uh, we love you and your work. Thank you. And uh, we'll do all we can to help the cause out there, Paul. Uh, absolutely, yeah. We'd like well, to see you guys get a lot more involved, and we're looking forward to uh, your next interviews next spring with the guys. And yeah. um, I just wanted to say, did you want to mention anything, Paul, about your website or 
Anything else you've got going on? Well, just so anyone who's interested knows, the website is Star Trek hyphen enterprise dot us that's all and then you know um and you've also I, got I, paul do you have one uh paul olson art dot com i think as well paul yeah olson art dot com o-l-s-e-n-a-r-t dot com and and there's a link there um but there's also all you know a bunch of other stuff i do but um uh the uh you, you know the star trek website gives you enough information to give you a teeth, and then, um, uh, you, you know, if somebody doesn't want to pop for the book, I mean, the, okay, I'm doing a little promotion here, but really, I, and I'm sure you'll second this, Boyd, the 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 price of the e-book, 995, or 990, yeah, 990, 999, is just, it's worth it just for the videos, if nothing else. It's a it's a it's a bargain for anybody that's interested in this, Paul. It's uh, I think it's wonderful that you've done it and taken the time. And we uh, again can't thank you enough for spending time with us today. I know you're probably pretty busy, and uh, I've, thank you so well, much. I've enjoyed it, and uh, it's lovely to meet all you guys. And you know we'll have to keep the ball rolling and stay in touch. We definitely will on our end, Paul. Good. Does anybody have anything else they want to say to Paul before we close up, guys? Just thanks very much for coming on. Oh, Thank you very much. Yes. No. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. And for me, Paul, I, I know I said some stuff in email to you before previously when I bought the book, but to me it's a great honor to, to have you here and, and, and meet you in person like this. This has just been a wonderful treat for me because I remember as a kid, well, not quite a kid, but a kid sitting there in the in the motion picture, watching the motion picture and watching those dry dock sequences, and I fell in love with a model, a studio model, in a way I've never... It, a film and a model never influenced me like that. It, anything else in my life in film, and to me, it's the one studio model that I absolutely love, and, and your work is a great part of that, and I really appreciate having the opportunity to uh, hear, hear you today and see you. Thank you. Well, Jerry, you're very kind and very gracious, and I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Paul, all the work that, yeah, I'll just close by saying that, Paul, that the work that you did on that makes us all hope and wish and believe for a better future. And it's, it, people say that it's maybe sound kind of corny, but a lot of us really kind of hope that that's what uh, mankind moves towards, and we get away from some of these problems that we're having. Uh, that we've seemed to have for so long and that the Enterprise is a symbol of that hope for the future and you just made it so look real look so real and so believable to millions of people and that's just something that uh, we can't we can't say enough about it and um, again thanks so much well thank you Boyd and um, let's um, let's stay in touch okay that's a wrap okay. everybody thanks for watching everyone and we'll talk to you all again really soon. Okay. Take bye, care, y'all. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Or bye, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so long.